Melissa, come forward. Welcome, Melissa. Thank you. Uh, I'm so glad that you're here today. And people here may not know, we, we got together earlier this week and we, we went through some questions, the conversation, uh, so that we could sort of unpack the story the, the best way. Uh, we have on the, the wall, of course, a map of Ukraine. And as I mentioned during the announcements, uh, we'll be talking about the, not only the experience of Melissa and Greg, but also Vera, Antonia, and Victoria. And we're, we're grateful for that opportunity to do so. So, are you ready for the first question? I think so. All right, the first question is, tell us about yourself. Oh, that's nice that you have the questions up there. That's good. Um, my name's Melissa, and Strathroy has been my home for the past 12 years. Um, originally from Niagara, but when my husband got a job for the County of Lambton, we thought Strathroy would be a good place to make a home, and we were right. Um, I do a lot of volunteering in the community. Um, I've been a long-time coordinator for the uh, Holiday Hamper Program at the Women's Rural Resource Center, so if you've ever been a recipient or a donor in the past decade, we've probably crossed paths. I also volunteer for Strathroy Pride at the market and at events, and um, I do bereavement support for VON um, because I'm a certified end-of-life doula, so I provide um, practical and emotional support to dying people and their families. Right. And we'll come back to talking about the, the doula thing when we talk about uh, motivation and spirituality. All right, next question. So you have relatives in Ukraine. Uh, what are you hearing from them about the, the latest news in Ukraine? And while you're answering, I'm going to play that video in the background that you provided me. Okay. Um, yeah, I have cousins in a few cities in Ukraine um, that I keep in very close contact with. Um, and it's been, you know, every day I check in on them. And, you know, if I read the news and I, I check to see what they're seeing and, and hearing. And basically, um, it seems to be like a lottery. It's not in the front page news anymore, but there are still missiles, you know, hitting every city around Ukraine. Um, it is mostly concentrated in the east and the south, but you know, if, if there's a summit such as NATO or G7 or Joe Biden says something that makes it to the news, then we start seeing the missiles just randomly coming to other cities without warning. Um, and it's just uh, really a, a traumatic way to live with your children, waking up to air raid sirens when you've had peace for, for a few weeks. So there's a lot of Ukrainians displaced within the country as well. Um, you know, a lot of people don't realize that in a lot of cities such as Mariupol, who have been, you know, all but leveled, there are still people living there, but, you know, they have nowhere else to go. But there are also displaced within the country, um, such as my own cousins. Um, uh, my female cousin is in Kyiv, and she is bound by the martial law due to the nature of her work, and she's separated from her eight-year-old daughter for months, and we don't know when they'll be able to see each other again. And she's being cared for by other relatives in the West. So uh, it's really difficult, and um, both of my cousins in Ukraine are bound by the martial law. Um, I do want to note that the martial law in general, um, men 18 to 60 are forbidden from leaving the country. They must stay in case they're called on to, to fight. Um, but also essential workers of all genders, uh, depending on the nature of their work, they also have to stay um, just to keep the country running. Um, but there are a lot of exceptions to this. So if you do see a man with his family here in Canada looking for help, we should reserve judgment because we don't know what his situation is, what his exemption is. Um, <clears throat> and, you know, maybe he was lucky enough to get out before the martial law was implemented. The, the video playing behind you while you were talking was so the example that you showed me of the many places that you've seen when you've been to Ukraine and then now how they look after the, the shelling, the, the missile strikes. Um, and it's probably not easy to, to look at. Um, 
living being in Ukraine, um, but even for us far away, uh, just for us to imagine. I, I'm, I'm hoping that that we can think about what if this was your backyard, and what you're used to seeing this church structure or a downtown building was suddenly destroyed the next day. Uh, so how did you come to open your house to this wonderful Ukraine family? And I, I put a map up there too. Okay. <laughs> um, well, my husband and I have been preparing our home since February when the war started for my own cousins, but as martial law continued to be extended over and over again, we were feeling really frustrated and helpless and we wanted to do something more. So we joined the Facebook group called Ukraine Help Middlesex. Uh, we started with um, putting together welcome baskets for newcomers, um, you know, toiletries and self-care items and, and uh, homemade uh, or handmade comfort items. Uh, and then I saw that there was a dire need for hosting families coming to Canada. So I had a discussion with my husband and um, we basically laid out uh, what we were able to offer and um, I connected with the coordinator. And um, a few days later, uh, a family popped up, their family photo of uh, three generations of women, 16-year-olds, their mom and grandmother. They were from Mariupol. Um, and they left behind their 19-year-old son, who was bound by the martial law. He's not able to come with them. So he's being cared for by volunteers in Ukraine. Um, and it said they loved pets, and we have three cats. So something just clicked, and I thought, okay, this, this is a good good fit for our home. So uh, we made the connection and, and we were able to speak with them online and get to know them a little better, um, make sure that our home was right for them as well. And as soon as it was finalized, uh, other volunteers just swooped in. I had two beds, I had bedding, I had towels. I had a ride from the airport within three days. Um, so it's just heartwarming that there's this whole network. We're not alone. It's all these volunteers working together to help as many families as possible. Can you describe the journey from Mariupol uh, into Europe and then to here from the family's perspective? Um, I won't get into too many details and I, I don't even know all of the details anyway. Um, and that map behind us just to show the sense of, to show the sense of travel that had to happen. Yeah, so they're originally from Mariupol, which is in the far um, east there. Um, and they were in a bomb shelter for one month. And I'm going to very simplify this and, and leave this out, but um, they were able to escape through a humanitarian corridor and it was extremely traumatic to come up from there and um, make the journey through volunteers on the ground, uh, drop off their son with volunteers in another city, leave him behind, and then move towards uh, Warsaw in Poland through the work of volunteers on the ground only. And then they were staying in a hotel that was provided for by volunteers in Warsaw. They were in one bed, the three of them, for two months. And then um, they had their flights provided for them. And that's why we only had three days notice. It was just, that's how the arrangement went. It's usually much longer, which, which hosts can uh, have more time to prepare, but this was an emergency situation. When the family arrived uh, to your house, uh, they'd been on a plane and traveling for just non-stop. Uh, you describe that evening, what it was like. My husband and I, I think we were very nervous and, um, you know, feeling that anticipation of three strangers moving into our home from a foreign country, speaking a foreign language. Um, they were very late coming in to Pearson and um, they had a ride from the airport so we, we didn't have the satisfaction of like, you know, meeting them at the airport and, and getting it over with. It was just we were waiting at home and they finally pulled into the driveway about 11 p.m. And, um, you know, just it was just uh, a lot of nervousness but um, I think a lot of relief when they got out of the car. We were able to hug and um, pull in all the luggage and you know, welcome them to their home, their new home <laughs> for a temporary time, um, and make them feel as comfortable as possible their first night. What has been the impact on you and Greg of, of this 
family taking in and doing this this uh, wonderful gesture. But what, and I know I, in my conversation with you, you're a you're a very humble person. Uh, and but what's it been like for you? What impact? How's it even changed you or, or grown you? Well, I think it's been huge, obviously, because it's usually just me and my husband and our three cats, and we have a very quiet existence, and we like it that way. Um, but, you know, now we have a teenager bopping around and, and three people in our home, so, you know, it's been a totally different dynamic um, in exchange for an epic sociological experience. Um, you know, we learn so much from each other, I would say, every day. Um, I get to see their resilience and um, learn lessons every day. For example, the Rogers outage on Friday. I'm freaking out about no internet. Um, you know, I'm stressing about it in the morning, and Tanya says to me, Melissa, we have electricity. We have food and water. It's okay. Oh, that's my lesson for the day. I mean, that captures so much right there. The things we take for granted and what we think are problems. How, it, along the same line, its impact on you, how has it impacted the way you see the world? It's a, it's a big question, but... Yeah. <laughs> I don't know, I think um, just to open your heart to do something. Um, you have to do something. You can't just stand by. Um, and, you know, the, my sacrifice of, you know, waking up a little earlier or, or having, um, you know, my basement taken up or my kitchen taken over for meals or, or things like that, it's really put into perspective. Um, you know, it's, it's actually a small gesture that I can do because I can't stop the war and I can't stop Putin. Can I offer my basement for a few months? Yes, I can do that. Small part of resistance and help. You talked earlier about being a doula, and there's there's a spirituality that goes with that. And I'm I'm wondering how it is that your spirituality motivates you to to do the right thing, to, to be helpful. How, how does this experience intersect with that sense of spirit? As a doula, I advocate for people. I use my voice if they don't have a voice. So I definitely make use of that in, in, in everything, all our documentation and paperwork and, and making sure their needs are met and their wants and make sure that they're living as comfortable a life as I can provide for them in my home and using my voice to stand up for them when they are unable. Um, in the same vein, I think you know, it's a ton of empathy I have for the human condition. And I'm actually the third generation of both sides of my family to have at least a hand in hosting refugees from either Ukraine or former Yugoslavia. And uh, I have a memory of uh, being asked to go through my Barbie collection and put some aside for my new cousins that were coming from Canada, which I reluctantly did. And then the memory is, you know, of them receiving the Barbie dolls and I'm watching out of the corner of my eye in another room and thinking, okay, well, that wasn't so bad. I could part with a few Barbie dolls if they have nothing. And, and those childhood experiences, they, they stick with you and they, they form you. Yeah, I think um, just my own family and, and myself just realizing that it very easily could have been us. Um, you know, had my grandparents not been able to immigrate when they did, um, it's very easy for us to empathize and realize we could have been in the same situation. Um, and just, you know, do your part to, um, you know, love your neighbor and, and reach out and, and recognize them as, uh, as human beings that, that it could easily happen to you as well. Yeah, this, this question of motivation is it's an important one for us as the church. What, 
what do we believe and how do our beliefs motivate us to action? Do we just roll some die and randomly make decisions? Or is there some core belief, uh, like love your neighbor as yourself, and some core experience we have of being, being loved by God that impacts how it is that we act in the world? And this question of spirituality and motivation is, I think, one that we, we each have to face uh, but each and every morning that we, we get up and we, we look at this world and the many challenges that uh, are in it. The last question is, what can people do to help, not only in general, well, let's start with general, and I'll, I'll sharpen it from there. So in general, um, we are still in need of hosts. Um, we are actually turning away people in London, Middlesex, because for some reason the, the word is spreading um, by word of mouth to Ukrainians um, that London, Middlesex, and Strathroy is a great place to live. And uh, they're hearing about it somehow, and it's, it's spreading. So we are getting a lot of attraction on our, um, on our Facebook group, Ukraine Helps Help Middlesex. Um, but we don't have the hosts. So uh, we are turning away people now. So I know that not everybody can commit to doing that um, or feels comfortable with it, but there's still so much you can do to support uh, our group. Um, We've got the welcome baskets that I mentioned, um, so putting towards uh, donations for toiletries, comfort items, self-care items, gift cards, anything from Tim Hortons to grocery cards, jazz cards to help us hosts out or uh, Ukrainians getting on their feet. Um, driving, uh, there's you know service Ontario appointments, doctor's appointments, uh, job interviews, airport runs. Um, if you've got furniture or linens to donate, if you've got job vacancies to advertise, if you've got apartments to advertise, um, I, I would love to see those posted on our group so that we can help our, our families that are already here and are still coming. Yeah, I, I want to, to emphasize that you and Greg are already doing a bunch of labor, so if people are interested in helping out the organization, please don't go to Melissa and Greg and say, oh, here, could you process this help that I want to give? They're already busy doing a bunch of stuff. There's a, there's a Facebook page where you can go, an organization where you can connect and uh, you know, provide that, that support. So you've described ways that people can support the organization in general. I want to focus the question now to what are some concrete, practical ways that people in this room or folk who are watching online in our community can help you and Greg, practical ways, things that can be done uh, to help Vera, Antonia, and Victoria. What are some few things that can give you a break or be supportive? This is tough, as we already discussed, um, because I don't feel that I need um, anything for ourselves. I know that we do, but it's very difficult to answer. Um, but in general, I'm still going to generalize it, because every family needs this. Um, it's just respite for the host. Um, I can't give everything to them. I can't. We both work full time. We're very busy, and I, I feel terrible that we can't show them um, everything that we want to. Um, so you know, if you've got a pool and you want to invite them over for on a hot day, um, and I'm not speaking just for my family, any family. Um, if you want to take a senior out for coffee or for a walk and help with some isolation and, and do some language exchange, um, you know, things like that. I would say respite care is what I call it. Um, just give them a new experience that the hosts may not be able to within their own home. And if uh, after church this morning anyone walks up to you and hands you 20 bucks, it'll be put to good use, right? It would be, yes. It would be, yes. Thank you so much for allowing this interview. Uh, and more importantly, thank you so much for representing Strathroy into the world. Uh, there are so many needs out there, and if we're all doing our part to, to meet those needs, uh, then we can support each other and and somewhere in there God ends up working and and
and something good happens despite the, the challenges of this world. So I, I think, how, how could, let's put our hands together and express our appreciation for the family. Thank you. Let's sing together. <laughs>